Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Sam Barra from Barra's Wine. Sam, how are we doing? All is well, Gabriel. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. No, thank you for coming. In fact, not just a winemaker, but the Wine Industry Network recently announced you are also one of wine's most inspiring people of 2024. First and foremost, congratulations. How does that feel to be just recently? This again, folks, this just happened this week. So how does it feel to kind of be recognized uh, as, as being one of, you know, there's hundreds of nominations. How does it feel to be one of 10 individuals that was, uh, that was actually uh, received this honor? No, you know, it's uh, truly an honor. Uh, I feel the industry is definitely shifting to be more inclusive, uh, but but also it, it has to do a lot with uh, the media writers where somebody truly is inspired of, of an individual story. And, and my story is definitely about the, the underdog, an individual not coming from multi-generational wealth, where you actually have to do the old fashioned way of possibly get a second job and save up for such an expensive industry that I'm in of, of course, wine. And I mean, imagine the odds out there, Gabriel, that there are just shy of 10,000 wine brands across the U S and yet uh, only about 1% maybe even just shy of 1%. The sad story is that they are um, Latino owned and imagine to be highlighted of one of 10 nationwide of, of brands where I definitely know some that exceed the production that I do here, my, I make in Oregon. And I definitely know many companies in California that exceed my production and they have been in the business for a long time. So it's it's a great honor. So let's let's take a step back first. Let's definitely want to start talking about these awards, but first let's introduce the audience. Who is Sam Bada and what is Bada Wines? No, I think yeah, thank you again. Uh so uh the full name is Juan Samuel Parra, uh born and raised in a very small town, but right in the heart of a really busy wine country of the beautiful Napa Valley. Uh, my grandparents on both on both sides of the family, uh, they seek the opportunity during the Bracero program, which allowed them work visas, which was also very, uh, in, it was integrated back then uh, with citizenship program. Uh, and it started with Eisenhower and this uh, continued all the way through the late 50s. And so uh, my grandparents worked for, decades and vineyard work and then for the next generation uh, i only had a few uncles working on the vineyard side but most of my aunts and uncles shifted to work at wineries and i do have two uncles that own their own wine brand they're in the same uh, situation as for myself purchasing grapes and operating in a cooperative but they have a chance to do a lot more pop-ups right in downtown napa and then it comes down to my generation, um, the the grandchildren, the the nietos and nietas. Um, some are involved in the wine industry, and I am the only one with a brand and and full time winemaking in on my maternal side of the uh, paternal side of the family. Um, and so, yeah, being born and raised and right in the heart of wine country. I feel one is uh, the product of their own environment where you are surrounded by the industry, you breathe it, you, li you live it. And even a deeper connection for myself in Northern Portugal, Northwest Spain and parts of Chile, barra means vine. And, uh, and I already uh, I mentioned how I, I have no lineage to those countries, but uh, para wineco in general, um, there's three ridges on the root of my logo and that and that's the storytelling of my branding of the three generations going now in the wine industry. I love it. I love it. And so folks, a quick little history lesson real quick. 
one thing you mentioned was the Bracero program, right? That was back in August of 1943. So now what that program was, folks, that was actually an agreement between the United States and the Mexico government that permitted Mexican citizens to take temporary agricultural work in the United States. Now, as, as Sam was mentioning, that also then turned into citizenships for some and many, really many. And so um, you know, when you when you hear about, you know, hey, go back to your country. Well, I mean, a lot of these individuals were actually asked to come here to help support that agricultural growth of this country. So again, without a lot of these individuals, none of this would be possible. So I just wanted to take a moment, pay homage to those individuals, because you know, like Sam mentioned, only 1% of the Latinos own wineries. Yet Juan, in your experience, you know, you live in a Napa Valley, what would you say is the number of Latino workers working for these wineries? Near or just ex passing 90%. Yeah, it's a it's a huge, yeah. huge disparity between the ownership and the workers. Uh now why 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 wine? Like you, you mentioned Barra's the vine, you mentioned your 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 you know your your uh, family's into it, but you also mentioned it was expensive. It's an ex it's not an easy, uh, it's not an easy business. So why, why do it? Uh, for, for, for myself, um, it's, it's something that again, surrounded my life nonstop where I did have an interest uh, out of high school. I actually attended Santa Rosa college uh, for two years where I had, um, I was taking administration of justice, actually, Gabriel. I was actually interested in uh, law enforcement or social work. Uh, but I was at the time of my age, I was enjoying the city of Santa Rosa more than Santa Rosa college and, and more with personal financial decisions that uh, you can imagine at one's age, I had to move back home with my mom and, um, and I did not attend school for an entire year to pay off my debt from basically uh, living with friends out of high school and moving to Santa Rosa. Um, and I had a longtime friend come back uh, from school. She was attending Santa Barbara and her family happens to own a winery. And um, I was just shy of being 21. And she did mention that their special events department is growing. If I would like to... Um, see what the job is about and it can lead to other opportunities and that winery also happens to have roots out here in mcminnville and that's when i first got to visit out here in 1999 and from there at 21 why wine because from since i was 21 i'm 46 now i have been mainly in the wine industry i have i've done my research in napa I've always dreamed about having a brand. The cost is very, very expensive in many parts of California, especially small counties of Napa Valley. Uh, but visiting over time out here in Oregon, um, it was really reminiscent to me of Mendocino County. Mendocino County is north of Sonoma County. It's a very spread out area. And, and again, this area ranging from Salem to the drive out to McMinnville was very reminiscent to me back of parts of Northern California along the coast. And it was more of the choice of an adult for my wife and myself to pursue our next step in life. And we wanted to be home, homeowners and we had to face reality where it was just not gonna happen or we were going to be just working our tail off in California to scrape up for a mortgage. And we have been very blessed making a move out here to Oregon. And my wine career continued. And we see our gains of our hard work. And for myself, having a daytime job since 2019, but also began to hand labor working an additional day during my days off with my daytime employer, that's the income along with some tip money that I set aside in a specific bank account and a business account. I'm sorry. And by um, 
you know, I was ready to purchase three tons. And, and now every, every year, I, as you see the growth, by being a self-funded company, that that's the beauty part of the industry. But now comes the part of seeking programs, grants, loans, because now it's time where it's definitely the growing pains, Gabriel, like any other company, where you just come to realize that, again, lacking the history of multi-generational wealth, you have to seek other opportunities. You have to seek assistance. And you just have to keep moving forward, Gabriel. Yes, that's a very good point. You know, at the end of the day, no <clears> business <throat> would fail if they didn't run out of money, right? Because everybody everybody would be successful if they never ran out of money. That's that's kind of the end goal. Now, one of the things you kind of mentioned before, we'll, we'll get into the grants and, and things of that nature here momentarily. But I want to kind of take a step back. And, you know, you, you, one of the things you mentioned, you bought you bought your three tons of grapes, right? And th that's kind of started. And so I think this is a really important thing to note. You don't own a field, but you own a winery. I actually do not even own a winery. I I buy grapes. I lease space at a winery known as a cooperative. And let me dive into how they operate. Please, yes. They they own the heavy equipment, such as that destemmer, such as a press machine, such as a sorting table. We, the clients leasing space only have to own our storage vessels. We have to own our own barrels, our own wine racks, our own stainless steel drums, our smaller tanks. Most of them uh, that I prefer are from an Italian company, Marchisio, and they hold about just an average, just shy of a ton. One ton of grapes will average about 52 cases of really good wine. And so again, I, I'm still in that micro scale. Uh, the next step for my company would be to find a commercial space to actually make it a bonded facility so I can focus possibly on just whites and rosés at a facility and still focus on reds at a place where still I may not be able to afford the, hev the heavy expensive equipment that I need for winemaking, but on whites and rosés, I already know at wineries that I can press my grapes, I can move my juice to my own cooperative and ferment just whites and rosés on site. Then I can move the wine to McMinnville and get it bottled and bring it back to the co-op because it's a bonded facility. So it, it's, it just goes into so many factors, Gabriel. As far as you know, on a federal level, we are selling, you know, we're uh, we're selling alcohol here, so it's a very heavy, heavy regulated industry. You know, that's a great point. And folks, I want to kind of take a moment to really kind of call out what uh, Sam is is kind of talking about it, uh, talking about here. One, he's he's talking about the co-op locations and and co-packing facilities, and the reason why this is so important. Is because you know, as you as you're hearing from Sam, this allows an individual entrepreneur to scale a business with their own funding by themselves, without having to take on capital funding, without having to give up their actual brand, right? And the way they're able to do it is because these co-op and co-packing facilities exist, right? And and what you see, you know, when you look throughout the state of Oregon, and this is this is kind of my call to action for 2024. Anybody listening, this is my call to action in 2024. What we need to do is we need to make Oregon the premier location for food and beverage. We already, we're the fruit belt. We have some of the best wineries. We have some of the best beer. We have some of the best culinary artists here in our state. What we need to do is we need to amplify that. How can we amplify that? As you, you, you look across the news and you're gonna see brewery after brewery closing their doors. That's a lot of skilled labor that is available for a lot of people. Now, what do these co-packing facilities look like? What do these co-ops things do, right? So these co-op, as Sam is mentioning, they have all of the equipment for you. So they have, think of those 30, 40, $50,000 capital expenses that you as an entrepreneur do not have to take on right away. You basically can go and rent out these locations and you can scale your business. In fact, Shakir Rimi, what she did during the pandemic is she actually used a strip club. She went and asked, hey, you guys, you guys, are the only ones still open. I need a kitchen. Can I use your kitchen during this time? Sure, by all means, right? Any way possible because that space is very limited. 
there's not very many co-packing and, and co-op locations throughout the I-5 corridor. So my call to action for the state of Oregon is how can we create more co-oping locations? How can we create more uh, co-packing location? How can we support the ones that are currently in existence, like Aiden over there at, at Swift uh, Cider? You know, if, if we can get, in fact, folks that are listening, if you need some co-packing locations, reach out to Aiden Curry over at Swift, uh, Swift Cider. He has some packing for over the, the 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 northeast Portland location. There's also location down in the Salem location, right? So we're what we're really trying to do is trying to create this ecosystem of growth within the food and beverage industry to kind of help support it and really help build organ economy. Because at the end of the day, when you come up to the Portland location, you come to the Salem location, you go down to all these very different mm. locations. Like when I go to Coos Bay, right? I go to Medford. I love eating at restaurant O down that location. I love going down to Ashland eating at those restaurants. And there's a lot of great restaurants here in Oregon. So how do we help amplify it? There's a lot of great entrepreneurs that are trying to build their build their ideas, build their brand. This is a way to do it, right? This is a small diving board. Sorry, so I'm going to get off my soapbox and start talking about that. Now, one of the things you also mentioned, uh, Sam, is, is actually funding. You know, as, as you're a self-funding, so you're kind of bootstrapping it yourself, and then you talked about the next iteration, going after grants, going after other funding. What does that look like? For here in Oregon, um, as far as uh, recent opportunities uh, and, and, and yourself being part of uh, Latinos Founders, um, and uh, it was definitely an honor to be at Pitch Latino, but also uh, many other organizations out through Salem Band in Portland. Uh, I feel Oregon is very pro-business. Um, I feel as for myself growing up in the Bay Area, you know, closed mouths do not get fed. You you definitely have to learn that from, from the beginning. Uh, it, it's a way to, again, continue to move forward and seek out assistance. Um, not to say that other states do not have the options maybe of Oregon, uh, because I have not really been a resident in many different states, but as far as uh, the support system that I've found here in, in Oregon has been amazing. Um, and so beyond Pitch Latino uh, through Latino Founders, um, I have been in touch with uh, with other programs, and it's just more of a matter of uh, staying in touch with their business advisors. And I also applied for one during Hispanic Heritage Month, which is which is actually a part of an international company, and they are in the very last steps of announcing winners. So I feel that I should not disclaim many details, maybe not to jinx my 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 grant in case if I'm going to receive one. Um, but they're coming near the final steps here of making announcements. Um, and again, for the wine industry, they, they are definitely one of the larger companies on a global level, Gabriel, that during Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Month uh, have uh, set aside 84,000 for, for grants, but um, they didn't announce how many recipients were going to win that. And that is, I feel like you're just kind of going down this trend of, of continuing to build awareness and presence uh, of your brand. You're, you're, you're getting awards, you're getting recognition. How do you do it? How do you build a How do you build a wine brand? The very first step, um, I feel that you definitely have to be very creative on, on the actual branding. Um, and the very first step for me was the support system I had at the Chemeketa Small Business Development Center in Salem uh, through Celia Nunez. I was referred to Willamette University for the law school. They, they trademarked my logo, Gabriel. I only I only had to pay the actual government fees uh, when you submit forms. It was only about roughly three hundred and fifty dollars, 
but all the time invested the students put into my my trademark then the work is overseen by the instructors which are actual lawyers the amount of hours they spent i was told by professionals would have been equivalent to around eight thousand dollars to what just cost me three hundred and fifty dollars and so that's the that's the very first step for myself being in a very competitive industry and i mean even i'm i don't even mean competitive on the on the quality of the wine i mean competitive on the market side because sometimes you're out in the larger chains and let's face it what really gravitates one from not knowing the history of a wine brand is their logo is their label and they just say hey Let's give this one a try. This bottle, this label looks pretty, pretty sharp or, you know, very unique. And, um, but from there, Gabriel, I'm going to mention something, something to you, which it has to do a lot with networking. It has to do a lot with maintaining relationships and staying in touch with relationships on certain professionals. I'll give you an example of two visitors that I had when I was senior wine educator at a winery in Napa Valley, okay? I had, in one case, I had a blogger. <clears throat> and this young woman was just getting started, okay? She was just getting started in blogging. And I'm talking about not even TikTok existing, um, I believe Instagram was around then, but she she came in the timing where there was a very large uh, group of chains of stores of Texas, okay, wine buyers of a chain called Specs through Texas. Very, very uh, a large um, company in different cities. A after After the tour and tasting was over, she she came up to me and said this is the best tour i had today and i and i was i was mixed with other groups and other wineries and 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 i and i'm, and I'm going to tell you this right now the the other tour guys or wine educators paid more attention to actual the trade visitors because they actually they 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 actually focus on somebody that had more wine knowledge versus somebody like me starting out as a blogger and and that happened twice during that job with these two individual young women gabriel one of them is a big shot for wine enthusiasts now and the other one is a big shot for forbes magazine and guess who they kept in mind over time and from there, their their articles that they wrote about me was just a snowball effect because, of course, they're in touch with other writers, and that writer, you know, reads the story and they're like, "Wow, we want to meet this person." And there's my friend say, "Let me connect you. He needs help. He's just starting out. They know my situation. They know my story." And from there, it was just a snowball effect, Gabriel. Yeah, and you know, I think there, you you made two really excellent points right there. Um, the first one <laughs> was really talking about the the students, um, folks. I think that's that's one thing entrepreneurs should really look at. If you have a business school in your community, reach out to that business school. Uh, of, there's a lot of folks that are going through the graduate program that want experience in the business level that are willing to help you with the work that you're doing. As Sam mentioned, especially with the logo and the trademarking thing, leverage that opportunity because it's an educational opportunity for those students as well, right? So so leverage that. So that's one, uh, which I thought was it was really, really kind of unique because um, I, you know, I don't think many people really think to do that. And then two, the networking piece, I, folks, I can't, you know, I think throughout this, we're going almost here on year three here on this podcast now, networking continues to be the most important aspect of a business and the way you grow your business and the way you brand yourself. Um, to your point, 
you know, to your point, being able to uh, still have these contacts from individuals that have now continued to climb the corporate ladder. And that's another thing, too, that's very important when you're climbing this corporate ladder. Very important to reach down and help those folks up, you know, that are kind of helping you up. Uh, versus stepping on someone because if you step on someone to climb get your way up the corporate ladder when those individuals make it to a different location like forbes like wine enthusiasts they're not going to call you because you stepped on them to get to where you're at but if you continue to climb and you reach down and you help them up to get to where they're going when they get up to the top guess who they're going to reach out to so continuously think about that when you're also networking. Uh, what's the value that you are bringing? Don't just continue constantly asking for something, right? What, how, at what point are you going to be able to reach down to help them up as well? So that that's really important. Now, Juan, you mentioned you know you're you have all these things going. You, in fact, folks, just so you know, this is going to be airing on June. What is that? June June seventeenth. So Wednesday, June seventeenth. And you actually have a pop-up the day or, or the same week of this uh, airing. So can you tell us about the pop-up event that you'll be having here in the next couple of weeks? Is that um, – oh, boy, Gabriel, let me oh, – Did I catch you off guard? Man, see that? Oh, no, Gabriel, uh, more yeah. <laughs> than our guest today. So, yeah, I believe you're having a pop-up. I believe it's on, on the, the 18th. 18th. Yes, on Thursday 18th. the 18th. So where is when that? You said, when you said 17, you, you made me nervous. I'm like, wait. <laughs> Uh, another thing to announce on the 17th is my very first red can wine is getting canned. My very first red wine is getting canned on the 17th. And uh, yes, on the 18th, I'm going to be at Hotel Zags in Portland. And this this is a very important thing that you had mentioned for my pop-ups. I am very proactive on announcing on Facebook, on Instagram, updating my my pop-up calendar on my website. I do not have a tasting room right now, everybody. So the way to support my company, come, come, come see me in action. Come ask questions in person. I am there personally pouring my own wines and happily accepting your payments for my product. <laughs> uh, so yes, I will be in Portland um, next week, but I'm, I'm very excited. Um, I'm branching into the can category. And not only that, being the second domestic Latino owned brand in the entire in the US to be in this category, which the industry keeps shifting to with Gen Z and millennials consuming less, uh, maybe due to, of course, big loans that they're paying off and many embracing sobriety. Uh, I applaud them. Uh, it's definitely one's personal choice. And you have seen the, the growth of mocktails and Gabriel in Portland. And, and that is that is one's personal choice, right? We, we are in this great nation of, the, of freedom that we have. But the beer, liquor, and wine industry is very nervous. And for myself, I just had to get the next step going on this industry that is now quickly changing, Gabriel. And the addition to Can Wines last year was a true blessing to my company, uh, having something on a more budget-friendly option. And even for myself, when I sell wholesale, being able to now have accounts such as pub, pub houses, uh, breweries, taquerias, or also the, the common spaces, you know, uh, the areas where they have the, the food trucks. Uh, for example, uh, one place um, in Salem is uh, the yard. The yard is a very large gathering place to go catch some live music. My white blend, uh, sparkling white wine, uh, the can wine did so well there. And of course they did so well in Corvallis and Eugene, of course, you know, big college cities. So um, I feel for myself as a winemaker, I, I make my passion wines, but I need to shift also of what makes sense for a business, Gabriel. Yeah. I, I, I'm definitely the small producer, but I have the mentality of a large operating winery, my friend, where if there's consumers out there buying the wine, I am making it. 
you can see the lineup of bottles behind me. I cover everything from dessert wine, aka port, a white dessert wine, forced carbonation, aka a sparkling wine. I do not do traditional champenoise method. That is too long of a time of an investment. But on whites, I make light aromatic whites. I've made heavier style of a Chardonnay on red wine, anything going from light all the way to a full body Cabernet Franc. And now, of course, coming out with my first red can wine. And next is a craft sangria. Yeah, I love it. So folks, some people, you... some people want to call it Sam Gria. Oh, I like it. See that play on words. That's how you build the brand, ladies and gentlemen. Find something that's quirky and the people that actually catch on to it. Now, one of the few things you mentioned here is one, first and foremost, your pop-up event that's coming. So this is a great opportunity to plug the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter. You can subscribe by visiting the shades of e.com. Please make sure to visit the shades of e.com and subscribe to the newsletter to get this information about the pop-up coming up. Now, also two things you kind of you organically kind of talked about. One, diversification and vertical integration. So let's let's talk about first diversification. What I mean by that, folks, diversification. So when he when Sam's saying that, hey, he doesn't have a tasting room, he's going to do a tasting room at a hotel. The hotel is now diversifying their offerings, right? They they are a hotel now. They have wine tasting. He also says he sells at a taqueria. Well, a taqueria is somewhere you get food. Well, now you can also be a wine tasting location. That is diversification, right? You're diversifying your offerings to the consumer to attract them, to attract more consumers. But then that's one. Now, Sam also was talking about going into the can industry. That is vertical integration, right? You're integrating your, you're still in the wine industry. Now you're just vertically integrating into the can industry, right? And, and eventually he wants to vertically integrate into owning his own dis distribution center, right? And continuing to grow, right? And, and that's that's the difference between you know, vertical integration and diversification. Now, diversification is not diversity, okay? That, that doesn't mean you hire diverse people. Diversification is truly offering different different products or offerings that entices a consumer to come back to you. So now, Sam, you mentioned, you mentioned the, uh, you're kind of going to the can. In fact, folks, another thing, so I'm going to go and shout out the YouTube channel. This is a great opportunity to plug the YouTube channel. Uh, Sam is actually showing us one of his bottles of wine, the bottle wines right here. Beautiful label. In fact, you can see the P has the roots for the symbolizing that para. Uh, and again, these are made here local in the uh, Marion County here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I like to call it the fruit belt, right? Um, so again, YouTube, you can find us at YouTube, the Shades of Entrepreneurship on YouTube. Look for the at the Shades of E. Uh, find these uh, videos. These full interviews will be on YouTube. Uh, they usually come out 30 days after they air. So if you want to actually see them the day they air, you please visit Patreon. Uh, the, the Patreon is a great way for you to support me as the podcast host and the podcast for as little as $5 a month. You'll get access to the videos. You'll get discounts. You get uh, uh, access to the actual video, um, book that I created as well and and as well as you know, some other uh, little perks. So enough, enough about that, but back to Sam and, and, and Bada Wine. Now, Sam, you mentioned the cans. What is what is the future for Bada Wines look like? Uh, the future for myself, I definitely want to scale back a little bit on glass and be more eco-friendly packaging. And to explain with this, again, this can be offered for the price point. This, uh, this is a 250 ml, two full glasses of, of delicious sparkling white wine that will cut right through any hot salsa at a taqueria or possibly try to go to the cuisine I really enjoy is Thai and Vietnamese food where, you know, possibly tell them, hey, this this actually works, by the way. Look at the wholesale pricing. Look at the price when you have your markup that is still a budget-friendly option for somebody to consume a delicious wine with a savory, delicious meal. Uh, this again has had success at breweries and tap rooms because to an, a couple or a group of friends might go enjoy some good beers, but there will always be the one person in the group that uh, might be even just sensitive to hops, Gabriel, 
where it, they, they're not being a snob by not having a beer where where they really gravitate to something more of an alcoholic options. So when I mentioned that I am a small company that thinks big, like a large company, I've just seen over time, many successful California brands grow where for myself, again, I can be now in a category with this of a budget friendly option of a wine in more eco-friendly packaging. And then to explain the next price tier or my plan, this is a beautiful label of El Toro y El Matador. Uh, anything you see in the white will eventually be see-through, just clear. So the shield and the ribbon is going to pop out a lot more clean in marketing. And this is what I plan to expand to go out and distribution out of state for future goals. And then, of course, you have the branded P logo. This will eventually be when I have um, a tasting room and I'm doing more elevated seated, seated food and wine pairings. The Parra Wine Co. will always, like right now, has a big, big following where I even make some wines that are such made in so, such small batch, Gabriel, where only the true believers, the, the folks in the base clientele list, Gabriel, get their hands on these very limited production wines. Got to get myself on the say, list, folks. I got to get I, myself on the list. Yeah. and But also not to mention for my future goals, how this will be more of the limited production. But the P logo, you can find this more at fine wine shops and restaurants in Portland. A big shout out to Republica. As you know, the power team that they are. Oh, yeah. And and all their other locations, my friend, they they place big orders of Parra Wine Co. where they save me the time and they they spread the delicious delicious wines to the four locations. But that's one place where you can keep an eye out for the beautiful P logo branding. That is a type of caliber of the market where these wines end up at the P logo. And again. You have this where you can find it more at at your corner liquor stores, at, at your at your mom and pop grocery stores. And then of course, again, hopefully being out more visible, as I definitely plan to sell as fast as possible as I can yeah. with uh, with a wine broker. I began to work in Portland as well to get those delicious cans out, spread yeah. out to, you name it. Yeah. Many, so folks, again. So folks, audio, just so just so you guys are aware. So what Juan is kind of showing you is three different labels. So one label is is kind of a more of a, I would say like a shield, like you'd see like a more European style um, badge, right? Kind of like a family shield. The the exactly. other one is the true P logo, right? The, the lot of wines that you've seen single those, vineyard wine yep yeah. and those are the ones you're going to see in the restaurants right and so you're going to have the variations you're going to see the kind of the the symbol the 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 crest we'll call it the crest the pot of crest you'll see those yeah. at the stores you're going to see a pot of wines in the in the in the restaurants and then the the third option that um folks if again if you're not watching on youtube if you're just listening to audio was the can version of the wine. So the, again, a can is very similar to the size of a white claw, I'd say, uh, size can. Now be mindful folks, again, just because it's the same size doesn't mean it's the same alcohol content. Wine is a little bit stronger than beer. So uh, just be mindful of that. Like, like Sam was saying, one of those cans is actually two servings of wine. So it's actually, if you think about it, it's a two, two pours of wine in one of those glasses or one of those cans. Now, uh, one, one, uh, uh, Sam, one of the things you're kind of going into, and I would love for you to really kind of dig into this piece a little bit. One, where can folks find you? Where can they get some more bottom wine? And where can they buy it locally? The best thing one can do for my company, I have it on Instagram, on Facebook, on my website. Email me, call me, DM or direct message on Facebook. I'm out often making personal deliveries. Another another way, through the website, you are actually purchasing the wines through a company that manages my e-commerce sales. 
They're actually based in Cornelius. And I wanted to let you know, when you buy wines online, they actually offer free deliveries in Washington County. And they charge a small fee for Multnomah and Clackamas. And then I take lead for any internet sale. I deliver through Yamhill, Marion, Oak, and I will even go as far south as Lynn and Benson County because I'm out maintaining my accounts or doing pop-ups, which I actually have one next Friday in Eugene, by the way, Gabriel. Um, and the third way is on my website there on the menu, you can actually find my wines in alphabetical orders in the cities. And not only that, when you go into the cities, the accounts are in alphabetical order as well. One looking to support a small business owner or even to focus more like myself to support a Latino business owner, this is just everything I'm pointing out is very important in general. The main thing is reach out to the owner directly. Like, yes, you can find, you can find my wines through the website at what stores they're at. If you feel that the timing will not be coordinating so well for, for me to make a delivery, yes, go buy it off the shelf. That will definitely help my company. If you live in Washington County, and as I mentioned, the internet company that's taking lead on partnership that we have for e-commerce sales, they deliver in Washington County and they're out often in Portland. But again, the very first thing that I pointed out, everybody, don't don't be shy. Whether you're comfortable texting or picking up the call me, email me, and again via social media, I'm um I have this right next to me, you know, uh, almost twenty four seven. I have to sleep sometimes. Um, so I cannot. I can. I that is the main thing for any small company. Buy from us directly, everybody. Love it, love it. In fact, I, I'm looking at the uh, looking at the products right now because my wine fridge is getting a little empty, so I might be putting an order here later on. Sam, thank you so much uh, for joining us today on the show. I really do appreciate your time. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we leave? No, just want to thank you again for your time, um, and let's get ready to yes, talk up some good red wine, some Parra Wine Club red wine. Um, there might be snow in certain parts of Oregon, and hopefully my Tempranillo and Cabernet Franc will warm me up a little bit. There you go. There you go. Again, folks, Bada Wine, that's P-A-R-R-A, -R -R -A, Wine Co. And then you can also, again, follow this. Follow the Shades of Entrepreneurship uh, a newsletter. You'll find this information at theshadesofe.com. Uh, you can also uh, help support me and the podcast by become a Patreon member for $5 a month by visiting the Shades of E on Patreon. Uh, thank you again, and have a great night.